you. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to what is the final uh, panel session of Fully Charged Live number one, 2018. This is our last panel, and I'm really excited about this one because it goes way beyond just electric cars. It goes into the whole other areas of the future. So I, and we've got a really, really top draw uh, uh, panel uh, to speak to us today. I will start with Hugo. Hugo Spowers is the founder of River Simple. Hugo, please come up. The River Simple car is downstairs uh, on display. Please welcome Hugo Spowers. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, Robert. Take a seat. Uh, Alice Gilman from Viva Rail. Battery trains. Yes. Excellent. And finally, Peter Paul van Voorst, who is not the tallest man from the Netherlands in the world, but very close. Peter, welcome. I, I went to see Hugo, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and you took me out in the, in the, in the River Simple car, the Rasa. It's an amazing car. It's, I, if you haven't seen it, do go downstairs into the pit garage and have a look. It is, the, it is the antithesis of a big, fat, heavy battery car, isn't it? It is beautiful. So can you tell us a bit about it, Hugo, because it is an extraordinary achievement. Well, you, you say beyond electric. It is, it is of course, still is an electric, electric car. Just, still electric. We don't uh, store the electrons in batteries, that's all. Uh, it's designed really with uh, uh, environmental impact very strongly in mind. Uh, so as, as, uh, as significant as the, as the technology, I think um, it, it, the business model is designing it to sell as a service. We'll never sell a car. We'll only ever sell mobility as a service. Much like a mobile phone, <clears throat> it's not a lease. So a monthly direct debit will cover everything, including fuel and, uh, uh, and maintenance and insurance. The, the big win really for us is that it makes efficiency profitable and the car does the equivalent of about 250 mpg. And that is amazing and I think it's, it, I mean, as amazing as the technology you're using in the car, the actual business model I think is what that I really love, that the fact that you're, you're, not, you know, you're not trying to sell cars, you're selling miles effectively, you're selling kilometres travelled and, and in the most efficient and least damaging way. Absolutely I, and I think that probably the biggest change we need to see if we want to have sustainable transport is not a technical one, it's not is, is it batteries, is it hydrogen or anything like that. We need to make efficiency profitable. If you sell cars, customers really will never pay a premium for a more efficient car. So just, and it's more expensive to make an efficient car. So it just reduces profit margins. So why is a manufacturer going to do it? So I think that, and, and consequently, the only thing left is regulations, but uh, if it reduces profits, the industry will only lobby against the regulations and then cheat when they finally come into force. Yes. So Not that any <laughs> large manufacturer has ever cheated. We know that. They're all very decent. So we just need to make efficiency profitable. Yes. That's what the model aims to do. Yeah. Now, Alice, I've had a ride in your train. I actually had a... I, I was allowed yes. to drive it. I forgot. Yeah, I drove it. That was, that was, I have to say, a big thrill. But I just heard recently that there are now some of your trains are actually going into service on the Welsh borders. Is that uh, correct? The first lot are going into service um, in the West Midlands, actually, and they West start Midlands. in December this year. But yes, we've just announced our second order, which is for a set of five battery diesel trains for North Wales. Right. So can you explain to us, yes. for those of you who haven't seen the episode which we did about Viva Rail, uh, the, the concept and the idea yeah. of what, what so you're doing. So essentially, we also have an electric train, and it's just looking for power. It's looking for 750 volts DC. Um, and the way trains traditionally do it is through diesel or through the overhead or third rail. So why shouldn't it go through a battery? We thought, and we designed that. We've designed the module so a battery can now be housed um, and power that train. And it's also that you're using existing rolling stock, which I yes, think that was are. what was real. Because yes. I couldn't believe it when I went in what looked to me like a brand new train. It was actually yeah. quite an old train. Exactly, yes. Oh. Yeah, we took the um, D78 stock, um, which is being retired early from London Underground, and we've used that as the body shell base for our new trains. Right. And so the idea is then you can use these trains on tracks that don't have uh, yes. electrification. You yes, can, you can we go beyond. Yes, just talking the... about it. Yes, yeah. you can. Um, and we've also developing the um, automatic charging point to allow that to happen. So on lines that aren't electrified Ooh. at all. Yes, indeed. You have oh, to come have and see this one. We have one. to come and see the automatic charging. <laughs> oh, yes, I love a bit nice. of automatic charging. <laughs> With a mobile battery bank. Oh, shall I say no more? Oh, oh, ladies and gentlemen, mobile <laughs> charging with a mobile battery bank. We like that. And then finally, Peter, I haven't really got a clue what you're... I know that there's something to do with batteries and ships. That's, yeah. that's about all I know. I just had my note that says, batteries, ships, you'll love it. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's about it. Yeah, we, we supply batteries to big ships. And uh, yeah, it's, it's actually mobile battery banks. And she's holding my business card because we can also do trains. 
All right. Um, but no, we start with ships because, um, because I love ships. That's a start. Uh, but also because I think it's very easy to make a big step there from the old diesel uh, engines in those ships to better electric sailing with the same ships. So we also convert those ships that are already out there for 30 years. And from that moment on, they can easily switch to better electric. When you say ship, I don't, I don't know how big that is. Are we talking large vessels or yeah. mid, mid-size or what, so, what scale? Uh, uh, longer than 300 feet. I think that's what you measure in here because we're from Holland. We're, yeah. not, we're not English. You can so. say it in meters now. People yeah. know. <laughs> Thank you. So our first customer that we will be sailing with this year already, uh, to which you're invited, is a ship of 110 meters. Uh, and it'll be using a battery that's about the size of this stage. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, a bit taller. Right. And that same battery will then be used for other appliances as well. And in that way, you can make it economically viable by uh, just thinking a battery is so easy to work with. It can be on a ship, it can be on a train, and it can be right next to uh, a festival Thank or you. anything. And, and by connecting all those different business cases, we can even make it economically viable for shipping, which is right. not necessarily an industry where you earn a lot of money. Because so. presumably at the moment, the, 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 I, I don't know how you describe range in a ship, but the, its, it's, it's reach is presumably limited to some extent by a battery. We're actually talking to uh, one potential customer that goes to England. So that might open up our English market. Um, but yeah, the, the range is hard to say because ships have so many factors that yeah. you have to take into account. But as a rule of thumb, we say you can uh, go on one battery for half a day to a day. Uh, but that size of a battery can also power a family with one kid for half a year. So that's right. kind of to show you the, the difference in energy use between the two. Uh, uh, Hugo, because the last time I spoke to you, you were, you were you know, talking about how you're going to launch this. How, how far has it gone? What, 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 what's the current state of play? Well, we've been developing the car that you uh, went in for the last two years. It's actually the fourth car, generation of car we've built. The first three were pure research vehicles. We've, um, this is the first car we've designed for construction use regulation. So we've actually been developing the technology for 18 years now. And um, <clears throat> we've currently got a, a run of 20 cars being built. Uh, our first production run, uh, going into a, a, a public beta test starting in Abergavenny in October this year. Filling station going into Abergavenny, and it's uh, for the whole county of Monmouthshire. Right. And we're aiming to get a volume production facility up and running by the end of 2020. Brilliant. Wow, wow that's fantastic. So if you live in Abergavenny then, you can subscribe to the, the River Simple system and then you can just go out on the street there's a car you get in it and you drive it and <clears throat> well how does it work on the ground we've got uh, about 300 people have applied for the for the trial we want to have some are going to the council uh, we've got two car sharing clubs who are taking a couple of cars and we're also looking for businesses and retail customers and typically they'll get the car for a month right um, we want to work with them for a month beforehand monitoring their car use and then work very closely with them while they have the car and see what, uh, how it changes their uh, driving behavior. But rather than testing and developing the technology, which we can do, we can thrash the car ourselves, uh, we're really trying to develop the customer proposition and the way we supply the car to customers, the way we support, support them in the field and so on, because it is a, a, a very different way of, of acquiring the access to mobility. Car clubs would be our customers we're very, very keen on. If you sell cars, of course, car sharing is rather a threatening trend because you just sell fewer cars. Yeah. Uh, but we're not selling cars, we're selling mileage, as you, as you pointed out. And so it really fits very nicely with our business model. If we can uh, keep our customers moving with fewer cars, it uh, makes more business sense. Now, Alice, all, the, all your trains are basically either electric with a diesel engine or electric that run on electric lines. Is it possible to have a rapid charger at each station that you yes. charge a lot of battery. I mean, is that something if you're, that you're is thinking something about? we're actively working on, um, modelling lines. We've modelled lots of lines, surprising, quite demanding routes that you can do this on. Right. Um, so, yes, with uh, charging points at both ends, yeah, you're, you're easily looking. We're saying, we're saying conservatively a 40-mile route. We don't want the battery to drop below 80% charge. Right. We want to keep it there because one of the things for our customers is that because of the franchise system, you want to have something that's going to be reliable through the length of your franchise. You don't want to have to be factoring in and um, buying new batteries halfway right. through. 
Right. So, yeah, that's one of our drivers. That's, that's, it is, it's such, I just love it. It's fantastic. I can't, and I can't wait. So uh, when, you, uh, when you do rapid charging, you're not yes. talking about plugging in wires. Is it something on the roof or how does it, how no, does it work? No, no, no. You can be plugging it in because if you've got the right. mobile battery bank, you need to give it a quick zoom. Right. You haven't got anywhere else to go. Yeah, it will be a plug that goes right. in. But automatic charging points, are they are smart. Right. They sit in um, a fourth rail. They're only active when the train's in position. Right. It's completely safe. And um, they are then connected to the, ch- the battery bank if there's no electricity supply available. Um, dump the power into the train. Um, the train can then take off. This is a battery train, our battery train, can accelerate at one meter per second up to 40 miles per hour. I mean, that, that is impressive. That's and the, fast. The, the train that you went on, that's yeah, yeah. better no, it's, than that now. It's got a bit, it's got a bit of welly. <laughs> you can give it a bit of welly, but you do it with a lever. <laughs> Great. And you don't have to do steering. So it's ever so clever railways. They're really clever. They are. There's no steering wheel. For them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, for you, Peter, what, what about the future for that? I mean, do you, can you envisage a time when you could cross a sea or an ocean in, a, in an electric ship? Yes. Uh, <laughs> ele- uh, electric, yes. Is the electricity coming from batteries only? I don't think so. I think yeah. it's a combination between hydrogen, um, different things, and batteries. And... Uh, I think what we are good at is is just supplying kilowatt hours, and I think it's yeah. kind of the same as as River Simple. We're not selling batteries, we're not selling battery packs, we're not doing that. We're supplying kilowatt hours, and what that helps us is a battery that we're building right now is around one and a half megawatt hours, and that'll be outdated next year, right? Because it goes so fast. But because a customer is only buying kilowatt hours. It, that's not it such a matter. consideration. So you yeah. supply the battery for its use, and it doesn't matter if it's eight years old. Uh, if you only need one and a half megawatt hours, then you, you use that. Yeah. So I think because technology is moving so fast, we can, we can eventually cross the oceans. And it's also, I mean, it's something I didn't know, but a lot of modern, for instance, cruise ships, you just always assume it's a huge, big diesel engine, and then like in the Titanic, a great big drive shaft. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, they've got electric drive systems already. That's yeah. already in use, isn't it? Yeah, most new built ships, uh, both cruise and transport and, and a lot of others, are already built as diesel electric ones. Right. And they have diesel generators somewhere else in the ship. And our job is replacing as many diesel generators as possible. As possible. Because the, the drive itself is, uh, is mostly it's electric. O- it's mostly electric. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I think we should open this up to the floor. I don't know. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if we've got a microphone because I'm just wondering. I'm imagining that there are some questions, uh, possibly. Yes, I can see one there. Um, on the back there. Uh, uh, uh. Um, I had a question for Peter. Um, when you've got a battery that sort of size on a ship, how do you go about charging that sort of battery? How, and how long does it take? Yeah, so uh, the reason why we started uh, thinking about swappable batteries. Uh, is because ships don't stop. They don't sleep. Uh, your Tesla sleeps when you sleep, uh, and then it has time to charge. Uh, but our ships don't stop, and where the ships have their, their stopping moments, there's no charging infrastructure. So what we do is we swap those batteries out. So a ship comes into port, we take out the empty one, we put in a new one, and with the empty one, we go to our charging point, where we can also do grid balancing, another business case, but where we can also see when is the next ship coming, and do we have time in the meantime to put the battery next to a music festival or next to Fully Charged Live or wherever there is a, a great demand for green electricity? So we, we swap them out. We don't let the customer wait. And presumably then at dock side, the, you know, the idea of swapping electric car batteries is quite technically complex. But presumably at dock side, there's a crane yep. and you join it onto the battery, you lift the battery. Is that, is that effectively what you're doing? The whole infrastructure is there. So, right. yeah, we're just plugging into, literally plugging into today's infrastructure. Right. Um, hi, my question is for Alice. Um, you mentioned about the rapid charging of your trains at the stations via a fourth rail. Yeah. Is that the same way as like a, mo- a current, uh, current third rail system or mod- n- normal trains? Um, it's similar, but um, the OR don't want any more third rail built in this country. So it's protected. It's not live at all. T- it's not live at all until the train is over and engaged and got its own controls in the off position. So th- that's kind of the difference. Good afternoon. Um, building on the uh, gentleman's question there, how long before um, we don't have to, con- if I can say the word, before we don't have to rely on electrification? Um, when are... Or when will we see the day that we could just rely on battery trains? 
Well, having had the investment so far in electrification, I imagine that, that's gonna, that they aren't going to dry out uh, and be taken out of service. Um, the government have said that diesel train, no new diesel trains must be built after 2040. So there's obviously going to be a big step change in, the, in that period. The current franchises are all running through and they'll start uh, doing the change. So I reckon, this is me personally, within about, say, 20 years, they will be dropping and dropping and battery technology is improving so fast. So we've also been working with Dave at um, Viva Rail uh, on an EU bid to do a hydrogen hybrid version of the yeah. Viva Rail trains as well. Right. Um, and that's applicable for longer range applications. Right. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, God, it's great. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel what they thought about with technology improving for batteries, but also with the finite resources of cobalt, copper and lithium, for example, where they see the future of, of where resources and how batteries are made go? Yeah, that, that's a big, a big thing for us because as a like, purely battery electric shipping company, uh, our main focus is on second life of current batteries, lithium ion with cobalt, nickel, those things. But also on the new version, what is it going to be? Graphene, uh, aluminium. Um, and what was really cool, I think, is a year ago, Mr. Goodenough, the, the inventor of the lithium-ion battery, came out with a paper that uh, there is actually a good possibility to do an aluminium glass battery uh, because he thought that the lithium-ion battery was not good enough. So he came with a new one. But um, that's, those are developments that we're following closely. And I think... Almost every day I get an email in my inbox saying, oh, maybe this is the new battery, maybe this is, can we talk to you about this? So it's hard to kind of filter out the, the real scalable possibilities, but there are definitely some out there that uh, will not use cobalt, nickel. And I mean, I think the thing particularly with batteries is the economic pressure or the economic incentive to develop new technologies that use far more common, commonly available cheaper materials that are easy to recycle is huge. There's an enormous amount of investment. Some of you may be aware of there's the Faraday Fund that was launched fairly recently by the government in the UK. It's a quarter of a billion pounds is going into research into new battery materials, new technologies. And there's certainly quite, there's a lot of, I've seen a couple of lithium sodium batteries, which is basically salt. And there's a lot of hope in that. But I think the thing is, we're, we're going to see varying technologies for varying roles. There'll be some that, it, that is ideally suited to static storage, for instance, to not for transport, but for large-scale grid storage. There's flow batteries being developed in Australia that have no lithium, no cobalt. They have a liquid that goes through a fuel cell, and they are, they are you know, hugely suitable for grid-level grid storage because they need to be drained to zero and charged to 100%. That keeps them healthier in exactly the opposite to lithium ion so they're more suited but you wouldn't have flow batteries in a car because it would be sloshing about when you went around corners <laughs> wouldn't be a good idea but uh, you know so I think that I think we're going to see big changes but it's also I think very much in your camp uh, Hugo that, that there's going to be combinations of fuel cells and batteries and it depends on the application where you know where they where they'll come into use absolutely I mean it's it's certainly not an either or question, hydrogen and, um, and uh, battery technologies are so different in their characteristics yeah. that we need them both, but for different applications. And yeah. uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the efficiency is something that we are very, very focused on. Um, so it's not a matter of pence per mile, but if we're really going to live off uh, sustainable energy, renewable energy, well, the first thing we've got to do is be uh, very focused on efficiency. You use it and, very wisely. Yeah. And that depends hugely on vehicle weight. So yeah. um, the, the, the case for, for battery electric vehicles is very, very strong for short range applications and overnight charging to stabilize the grid. Um, but for longer range applications, I mean, the, our car weighs less than the battery does in a Tesla, for yeah, instance. Yeah, I love that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and at that, once you, once you look at the sort of range to which we become accustomed, hydrogen can be massively more efficient than yeah. anything else. Yeah, we've got to wind it up. I, I, can you please give a really big round of applause to our fabulous panel? Thank you.